Thank you very much again for being here. So <clears throat> this last lecture, I will uh, state some more recent results about the density of torsion values. So let me recall, I start by recalling uh, the definition of the Betty map. The Betty map, the, uh, it is associated, well, first of all, we have this family of abelian varieties. And uh, their common dimension is G. <coughs> and we have a section, which we call P. And the value P of S is a point in AS. So to this section, which everything is defined algebraically and varies algebraically, uh, we associate the Betty map in the following way. Last time I defined it for the Legendre family, but now let me give the general definition, which is very similar. So the abelian variety AES is analytically isomorph isomorphic this time to a torus in uh, defined as the quotient of uh, G power of complex uh, numbers by a lattice. I denote the lattice by lambda S. And uh, <coughs> this association, uh, so this is only, this, this is an analytic isomorphism. And uh, one may show uh, that uh, the lattice may be, one may choose a basis for the lattice which varies <coughs> locally, at least locally, in an analytic way. So let me write this. Let us assume, uh, uh, so the, the space S may be covered with open sets, U alpha, and on each open set, I omit the alpha for from the, not to complicate the notation, uh, the lattice lambda S, we represent it as in this form. So, it is generated by two G vectors, each of them lies in C to the G. And uh, uh, we may assume that locally these vectors vary in <coughs> an analytic way. And they are linearly independent of our R. So in this, with this notation, with this notation, then every point in AES, so for instance, P of S, may be represented, corresponds, modulo the lattice to uh, a vector in uh, C to the G, and then we may represent this vector with coordinates which are real. Let me denote by beta one, beta two as these coordinates. And uh, the Betty map is simply <coughs> given by these coordinates. So it takes values in R to, to the power 2G. It is locally analytic, and uh, it is uh, uniquely determined modulo integers. These functions here are real analytic. Not complex analytic. 
But an important fact is that the fibers of this map, so the Betty map locally it goes from, uh, we may say, from an open subset U alpha to R to the 2G, is real analytic here. It has certain monodromy uh, transformations when we change uh, the, the open set. It is subject to certain monodromy transformations. And uh, uh, an important property is that the fibers are complex analytic. This is uh, clear on looking at the definition. Uh, when we want to compute a fiber, we just substitute for these betas fixed complex number, uh, fixed real numbers. And then uh, this becomes an equation, a system of G equations, uh, between, uh, among uh, analytic functions. So the fibers are analytic. This was at the bottom of uh, the fact that, uh, for instance, in the case G equal one, uh, the Betty map is either locally surjective or it has, or it is locally constant. Just because the fiber cannot, cannot be, the image cannot be a real uh, arc of a curve, for instance. And uh, so this, uh, uh, and the, the fundamental property for our uh, setting is that uh, S is a torsion value Torsion value means that P of S is a torsion point of AES. Uh, excuse me. The U alpha are a covering uh, of S by uh, good open sets where the thing is analytic. Uh, I omitted this from the rest. Uh, so S is a torsion value if and only if the value of the Betty map is rational, is a rational vector. So this is the fundamental property for us. So, uh, so each fiber, so for instance, the set which I had denoted uh, uh, Tn, Tn was the set of S such that n times p of s is zero. So it's the set of torsion values of order dividing n. So this set is uh, a union of fibers of the Betty map because uh, the value of the Betty map at each point in Tn is a rational vector with the denominator n. So it is a finite union of fibers. <coughs> and these equations show that each fiber, by theorems in complex geometry, each fiber <coughs> has either codimension at most G or is empty. So we have already a kind of a description of what the fibers can be. Because when we, when we fix the betas, we have G, so these are vectors in C to the G, we have G equations, and so the fiber either is empty or has codimension at most G, at each point. So this is uh, uh, another important fact for studying the density of torsion values. For instance, when the codimension is exactly G, everything runs fine because uh, the image will uh, have the right uh, uh, the dimension. Uh, the fact that we want to avoid is when the codimension is, sm is, uh, is smaller. So when the dimension of the fibers is high, then the image will be smaller. And then we 
uh, we're not uh, generally able to ensure that uh, there are torsion, that, that there are rational vectors in the image. So I recall also the theorem of Manning. If the family has no constant part, then the Betty map is constant if and only if the vector, uh, the point P is torsion. So if it is constant, these constants are uh, uh, rationals. Uh, no constant part, I don't give a formal definition, but roughly speaking means that the abelian varieties AES are non-isomorphic. So this was the theorem of Manning and the corollary. In the case uh, G equal one, if we know, if we start from a P which is non-torsion, then we have density of torsion values. So we sketch the proof of this. Let me make a small pause here. In the elliptic case, so in this case, there are very uh, strong results which go beyond uh, density, and there are results on Galois equidistribution. Galois equidistribution, I very briefly mention what is uh, meant. Uh, let us say that we work over Q bar. And uh, so the, these points S, the torsion values, S will be defined over Q bar. Say to, for the sake of explicit example that we take the Legendre family and uh, say we take this point like the, uh, the previous times. So let us take a torsion value. It will be a, an algebraic number such that P torsion value S naught will be an algebraic number such that uh, the corresponding point is torsion. And then we may form the Galois conjugates of this point. And uh, a recent theorem uh, proved by <coughs> De Marco Mabraki, actually in completely general situation, uh, in the elliptic case, but general, proves that these Galois conjugates tend to be, as the order of the torsion of the point grows, tend to be equidistributed in the, in the space uh, where S lies, in this case, S lies in P1 minus three points. So tend to be equidistributed there with respect to a suitable measure. Uh, these theorems uh, are obtained uh, by using uh, tools from dynamics and also deep results by Zhang and Yuan and other tools. Uh, so this is uh, somewhat more than density because when the order is very high, we shall not be able to say that every open set will contain uh, some torsion value, but every torsion point will have the right number of conjugates asymptotically in that open set, which uh, this number will be just the measure of that open set times uh, the degree. 
And the degree, by the way, has been estimated from below by the uh, work of Masser and Sinu David, as I uh, recalled in the previous lectures. So the degree grows in a certain way, and this gives uh, supplementary information on the... Uh, concerning the measure, I cannot uh, spend time on this, but uh, this measure is quite related to the Betty map. It is the pullback of the measure on the square by the Betty map, actually. So this is uh, quite useful for the arithmetic. Let me state another corollary uh, of Manning's theorem, uh, which is a criterion for deciding where if a, a point like this, so a functional point, oh, sorry, this here I had P tilde, which is the abelian logarithm of P. Excuse me. Yes, but for a section, yeah. It is obtained uh, just by looking at the Betty coordinates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, wh when we are given the, the point P, like this, for instance, or any other algebraic point, the uh, theorem of Manning also gives an, an effective criterion to check whether the point is torsion or not. This may be done in a lot of ways, but it's not an entirely trivial issue to decide whether a point is or, or is not torsion. From the Manning's theorem, we obtain a differential criterion, which is the following. P is torsion if and only if the Gauss operator that I don't spend time in, uh, but uh, that I had introduced the previous time, if the Gauss operator applied to the abelian logarithm of the point is zero. And this holds because the Gauss operator, uh, uh, the point is torsion if and only if it has constant Betty coordinates. And uh, constant Betty coordinates mean, means being a, a linear combination of the hypergeometric uh, functions, solutions of uh, the Gauss uh, equation, and uh, means exactly this. Now, this might seem useless because p tilde is an abelian logarithm and uh, is a transcendental function, but it turns out that the Gauss operator applied to p tilde may, is, may be expressed algebraically in terms of the coordinates of p. So this uh, amounts, then the checking of this equation amounts to check whether a certain explicit algebraic function is or is not zero. The Gauss operator in the Legendre case, uh, this is for the Legendre. Yeah, yeah, I limit myself, but there is a criterion, criterion like this uh, with more differential operators also in the general case. So now let us uh, go ahead. So our task is to prove density, I repeat this, prove density of torsion values. And when, under which condition? If the dimension of S is at least G. This is a natural condition. Uh, for instance, uh, as follows by uh, looking at the Betty map. Actually, uh, of course, and we have also the other assumption that uh, the family has no constant part, and then we also assume, we also assume no constant part. and that the multiples of P are dense, are the risky dense.
So, and the attack to, to prove this density is this, the task becomes to prove that the differential of the Betty map has maximal rank. Suppose, for instance, that we are in the critical case where the dimension of S is exactly G. This is the critical case. We can always cut the space with, uh, if the dimension is larger, we can cut and reduce to this case. And then uh, the Betty map goes from uh, open sets in a space of complex dimension G to R to the 2G. So it goes, it may be viewed as a map from a real 2G dimensional space to itself. And uh, it have, if the differential has maximal rank uh, generically, generically, then on a dense set, this map will be open. And for an open map on a dense set, uh, the inverse image of a dense set is dense. So we obtain the, if this property holds as a consequence, we have the density of uh, the, the sort density. So this generalizes the Manin issue. Manin studied the case when the differential is identically zero. And there are all the intermediate cases for uh, G greater than one. So, so let me recall some results. Some results. Okay, Manin is the one that we already saw. I quoted also a result by Kritschever. This was a result holding for the hyperelliptic Jacobians. I will come back to this uh, special uh, situation in a moment. And then there is uh, recent uh, work by Boisin. She was interested in Lagrangian vibrations, but uh, uh, as far as I can understand, this uh, is in practice the case G equal to of our, of our issue. And uh, she uh, proved density for G equal to under these, uh, these assumptions. So uh, before illustrating the more recent results, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he does the same, yeah. He, she, she, she does not <laughs> mention a Betty map explicitly, but uh, uh, the underlying uh, method is, is similar. Uh, I will illustrate some more recent results uh, with, uh, obtained with Andre and uh, Corvaya uh, by using a, a tool additional to Wazen that is the differential Galois group structure uh, of uh, abelian logarithms, which was studied by André. Uh, but before that, I would like to uh, say something more about the hyperelliptic case. And this hyperelliptic case occurs in connection with the Pell equations to be solved in polynomials. And uh, the issue uh, is the following. Uh, the usual Pell equation is the following one, where D is an integer. And it was proposed actually by Fermat. 
And uh, it is uh, extremely classical, of course, in uh, elementary number theory, and important because it underlies several central issues in uh, number theory, including class numbers, quadratic forms, uh, general quadratic, binary quadratic forms, and so, and so on. Uh, this was uh, studied uh, long ago, but uh, also there is a polynomial version in which uh, D now is a polynomial depending on a variable T. Let us say a polynomial over the complex field, uh, although also the choice of the ground field may change the issues. And we want also to solve the equation in polynomials. And D, of course, we assume uh, that it has <coughs> even degree. Let us indicate it by twice small d. And the issue is when is to, find, to describe the Pellian polynomials. Uh, are those for which there exists exists a non trivial a solution, a solution with with y different from zero. So this equation was studied already by Abel. Which, uh, who, who related it to integration, in explicit integration of certain uh, differentials on hyperelliptic curves. And indeed, indeed, the solvability of the Pell equation is uh, quite related to a hyper, the hyperelliptic curve uh, obtained by this equation. Let us assume that D, for, for simplicity, that it has no multiple factors. So this defines a hyperelliptic equation of genus, in that case, a genus uh, D minus 1. So why is this related? Uh, well, by factoring the equation in, in the function field of the hyperelliptic curve, we easily find the solvability criterion. Which says that D of T is Pellian if and only if the divisor, this divisor, what is this? It is the difference of the two points at infinity that we don't see in this affine equation, but which we find in, the, in a projective smooth model of the same curve. So it has two points at infinity. They are the two poles of the rational function T on the curve. We make the difference. It is a divisor of degree zero. So we may view it as a point in the Jacobian of the curve. And uh, D of T is Pellian if and only if this point viewed in the Jacobian is torsion. This I will, the, the proof is, uh, is, is easy. So this, of course, relates with our issue because uh, when we let the polynomial D run through a family of polynomials, we find a corresponding family of Jacobians, which are abelian varieties, and uh, we have the, our section, our point is just uh, uh, this one, the image of this in the Jacobian. So we may ask questions about the distribution of polynomials which are Pellian. When, for how many polynomials uh, will be the Pell equation solvable? And actually, 
So th this issue appeared explicitly in Kritschever, for instance. Kritschever, uh, with the application to uh, the Schrodinger operator, he, he applied uh, this, uh, just this section on this same family. But uh, this, this occurs also in other contexts, which I cannot uh, devote time to this, but for instance, it appears on the polygonal billiards studied by Muller and uh, McMullen. They come in certain times from uh, Pell's equation. Then uh, in the theory of extremal polynomials on disjoint intervals, often these extremal polynomials are obtained from solutions of Pell's equation in genus one or more. And then we studied this also with uh, Maser uh, concerning cases of the relative uh, man in man for the, the, that I mentioned last time. So, so in this case, for instance, one can uh, one can prove the density. Oh, and uh, there is a question. Other questions posed recently, sir, for instance, asked explicitly. Again, for this family, asked expli explicitly for the density of torsion values, but restricting to curves defined over the reals. And uh, he was interested in this because uh, for an application to a paper of uh, R. M. Robinson on conjugates of algebraic integers lying in uh, prescribed regions. And this paper of Robinson uh, contained uh, an unproved fact uh, which would follow, would follow from this density. And this at least was Sarah's motivation. Uh, and uh, this was answered by Brian Lawrence, the same uh, young uh, person just obtained his PhD and uh, that I mentioned last time. He obtained a very original solution by looking, uh, by computing explicitly, in fact, the, the differential of the Betty map. He didn't call in this way, but he was using the same uh, object. He computed it in the gen in points where where the, the, D, the polynomial D has double roots. And uh, then was able to extract from this degenerate case the uh, maximal rank of the differential. Another method to treat uh, the, the hyperelliptic case and also which gives an alternative answer also to in the problem of, uh, on the reals is to look is to look at the fibers of the Betty map. So, and argue in the, in the following way, if the Betty map has not differential of maximal rank, then the fibers will have dimension larger than expected. And then we need only show that at certain points, uh, there are theorems in complex geometry which ensure that then all the fibers would have the same, uh, similarly, also larger dimension. Even if the map is real, the fact that the fibers are complex allows to use these theorems and uh, to prove that uh, all fibers would have larger dimension. And then it suffices to find points where the fibers have the correct dimension and these points are just given by uh, the points where this is torsion. It suffice to find one point where the fiber has the correct dimension and we are done. And this point may be produced by producing an explicit solution of the Pell equation for spatial D, for instance. 
So just going to a special case in a different sense than uh, Lorenz. So in his case, he goes to special points which are degenerate. With this approach, one goes again to a special point, but which is uh, a legitimate point. Anyway. So, and then there is a further solution by Bieli Maps, but I skip this because of the time, of course. So, let me, so other, attempt, so let me describe then other methods. So this is, an, these are two methods which work in this case. Other methods, one might think, uh, last time I sketched a different argument for Manning's theorem coming from integral points. And this does not work at all. It completely breaks down for genus larger than one. Another possible approach would be the following. Uh, let us le say that S is a surface, for instance. And uh, we want to prove that, and th that G, G equal two, say. G equal to. We want to prove that the Betty map has maximal rank. If not, the fibers of the Betty map will be complex curves because they are complex varieties in the surface. Uh, if the Betty map is non constant, they can have only dimension one generically. So we shall have complex curves on S where the Betty map is constant. And then we may think of applying the theorem of Manning, which deals with the constant case. However, these curves will not be algebraic. Uh, nothing ensures that they are algebraic. So they would be analytic curves. And for analytic curves that I know, I haven't been able to locate the results on the monodromy, which allow to repeat the uh, proof by Manning. So also this argument, uh, this kind of approach, I can't say it doesn't work, but uh, there are obstacles. So we have a new, uh, another approach. So approach for this problem, and this is joint work Kreisever uh, uh, for the hyperelliptic case and that particular section uh, worked for energy. Uh, was then in her context of Lagrangian vibration uh, dealt with the uh, general case of G equal two. At energy, so we, we uh, sorry, yes, I canceled this <laughs> now. And uh, in any case, uh, this is another approach. Uh, let us see uh, where it goes. I, it doesn't uh, yet solve the, the general case. So this approach is based, so we go to the Siegel space. So we look, we look, we look at S as embedded in AG, the modular space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. Uh, principally polarized is not a, an assumption, but we can reduce to that. So we may look at S uh, as a sub, uh, sub variety of the full modular space of that dimension, and then we go to the Siegel space, the Siegel space AG, uh, is a uniformization for AG similar to the upper half plane uh, for uh, in the case of elliptic curves. So uh, this Siegel space is, consists of the matrices Z, which are 
G times G complex matrices. Symmetric. And such that the imaginary part is positive definite. So, so this allows to, to view our abelian, to associate to the abelian varieties in our family corresponding uh, matrices in the Siegel space. They are not uniquely uh, determined, but we can certain locally, we have a correspondence so that A of S corresponds to a single matrix ZS. And the correspondence is locally analytic. So we have the following uh, uh, differential criterion for the Betty map to be uh, of maximal rank. So I state this as a criterion. Let us maintain the above assumption of no constant part and the section uh, 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 with multiples which are the risky dense. So suppose that the rank of the differential is not maximum. Then, for each S, say in an open set, let us uh, this thing, this association is only locally analytic, so let us restrict to open sets. For each S there, and for each vector C in C to the G, we take the vector ZS of C, which is a vector in C to the G, varying analytically in S. Well, this vector, the conclusion is that this vector has vanishing Jacobian determinant. With respect to a choice of uh, coordinates uh, on S, uh, complex coordinates. So this is like saying we can reformulate the condition in several ways. Uh, we can uh, also say that locally the space capital S is fiber with curves such that this vector is constant along each of the curves. So it's fibered by level curves for the vector. And this happens for each, for each C. Now, in itself, uh, this does not. Uh, but let me show, illustrate how this condition may be used. First, it is a condition which does not depend on the section. So, to use the section is fundamental to obtain this result. But once uh, we have it is a condition only on the abelian family and the section has disappeared. So if an abelian family violates uh, it, this condition, then we know automatically the torsion density for all sections, satisfying the assumptions. So it, uh, we still don't know whether there are cases where this condition is uh, holds. Uh, we think not, that there are no cases uh, provided the uh, above assumptions are, uh, are verified. In recent work with Gao, 
uh, we have checked that the recently announced uh, ex channel uh, former conjecture uh, recently announced by Mock, Peel, and Zimmerman is enough, for instance, to prove that this conclusion does not hold if S contains a so-called hot generic point. So it may hold only for families which are contained in a proper so-called special subvariety of the modular space. And apparently a refinement of the argument should lead, but this we have no yet proof, should lead again under uh, using this powerful uh, uh, conjecture proved recently, should lead to the general case. Anyway, uh, let me show, for instance, for G equal to how this immediately leads to, uh, one can immediate, almost immediately show that the family can't verify this. So for G equal to, let us look, we have the Ziegel matrix, and it will be, say, uh, consist of four functions. It is symmetric. And S is locally, S is a surface. Locally, we may view it as, the, as C squared. Analytically, analytically, an open set of C square. So let us look at the first column of this vector. Uh, the first column corresponds to take the C here equal to one zero. So for C equal to one zero, we obtain the first column. Now, if B of S is not a locally constant function, let us assume this fact. Then locally at some point it may be taken a, a, as a coordinate. As a coordinate. So, let us write B of S equal S, a coordinate on a local, on a, on a small open set. But then the Jacobian determinant, so the vector now is here a function, A of S, and here X, which will be a coordinate. We shall have, uh, so the, this vector, now the conclusion here says that it has vanishing Jacobian determinant, so it depends really on one parameter. So this means that this entry here is a function of x, is an analytic function of x. We may write to this. By the same argument, choosing now the vector c equals 0, 1, now, the second column is this one, and by the same, applying the same conclusion, we deduce that also D depends only on X, but then the whole matrix depends only on one complex parameter, and the condition that uh, it has no constant part is violate, uh, uh, violated because the family has uh, analytic dimension two. This is part of our assumption. So this is the first case. The second case is similar. If, if B is constant, then we have two constants here. Then if B is constant, let us call it B naught, then now A, either A is constant but this is again impossible because then we have again only one thing which varies, and whereas our family has analytic dimension two. 
So A must be non-constant, and as before, we may take it as a parameter at some point by the implicit function theorem or uh, this, by the implicit function theorem, actually. Now, now we have only this at disposal. And now we can take the vector C equal to 1, 1. Then the matrix uh, applied to this vector gives this. And now again, this depends only on X. This has depend only on X because the Jacobian determinant vanishes for all, for all choices of, of C. So again, this uh, says that the family has analytic dimension one. So this is a sketch of the deduction from this criterion. How <clears throat> uh, readily it follows that the criterion cannot, uh, the, the conclusion of the criterion cannot, can never hold under the previous assumptions. We have a similar, more elaborate uh, uh, list of cases uh, which grows rapidly with the dimension actually. This kind of argument may be repeated, uh, but it grows uh, rapidly. It leads also into a problem of linear algebra called the Dieudonné problem, which was treated by Lovac, for instance. Uh, but uh, it concerns the spaces of matrices which have uh, uh, such that each matrix in the vector space has, is singular. And uh, there is no simple characterization of, of the situations in which this happens. And uh, this situation, uh, this condition leads to such a type of, uh, of uh, condition. So unfortunately, it cannot be treated uniformly in the genus. Let us say that for G equal three, we have done the, the distinction into cases and it works. Yes. Yeah, it is used to obtain the criterion. And I conclude just by sketching uh, the proof of the criterion. So sketch of proof of criterion. So three simple points. Uh, the first point is simply to use the equations This is the defining equation of the Betty map. We conjugate it to use that the betas are real. We just conjugate. And we obtain the complex conjugate. And then we, we have the right number of equations to invert. So we may invert and express uh, the Betty map, the coordinates of the Betty map as rational functions in the entries uh, of, uh, of P tilde and uh, the row i's and, and their conjugates. So here we have functions which depend on S and uh, the conjugates. So we may express the conjugate function which depend on S bar. So we have both, we have not an analytic function. The Betty coordinates are not analytic. They depend on S and on S bar. However, explicitly as rational functions uh, evaluated with analytic entries in the uh, S and S bar. Now we express what happens if we differentiate this. So the second point is differentiate. And uh, uh, if we differentiate 
and we take the determinant. Something very complicated will appear, but it can be kept under control in some way. And now this, this, uh, this will be e identically equal to zero for all values of S. But now, if an analytic expression in S and its complex conjugate vanishes, it vanishes also by replacing S and S bar by two independent complex variables. So now we have, this is the gain, we have in place of S bar, it will remain zero if S, S bar go into two independent complex quantities. So now we, we specialize one of the two and we look at the ex expression depending only on one variable. Now we have an analytic, a polynomial in, uh, really a polynomial in the entries of uh, P tilde of S, the rho i's, and their derivatives. equal to zero. Now enters the theorem of André. The theorem of André says that the entries of the abelian logarithm are uh, under the assumptions that we are working with since the beginning, are algebraically independent over the field generated by the entries of the lattice basis. And also we can also put there the uh, function field of uh, the base variety. And uh, this uh, statement of algebraic independence actually says that there is a relative Galois group, so a Galois group, differential Galois group, which fixes all the rho i's and uh, changes the, the abelian logarithms. And uh, the Galois group is maximal, so it's, it sends the abelian logarithm to any uh, itself plus any fixed vector. So it is isomorphic to the additive group of C to the G. So now we may act with this differential Galois group on this polynomial relation. The relation is complicated, but it may be uh, kept under control and the action of the Galois group, uh, the relation continues to hold also after acting with the Galois group, and this eventually leads to uh, the vanishing that I have stated in the uh, criterion. So this is the argument. Uh, yes, uh, I skip, uh, there is also, this may be formulated in terms of the so-called Kodaira-Spencer map, but it leads to, uh, equivalent uh, statement, only di formulated differently. And uh, then I would substantially uh, stop here. Voisin informs me that by using this criterion, uh, she has gone up to G equal eight. So she goes beyond that. So I don't know if the X channel will eventually work, then this will settle for general G, but still we don't have a proof. So I would stop here and thank you very much again. I have been greatly honored, of course, and uh, I deeply thank uh, uh, for the hospitality and uh, everything. Uh, yes. We, we use the criterion, but yes. Using as well. No, not again. Different, different. So no, the criterion. We start from the criterion, and we apply X channel 
to the situation obtained by the criterion. We, uh, X channel is applied, uh, is applied to the level cu curves. So this is vanishing Jacobian determinant, so there are level curves. And uh, these curves uh, give uh, an intersection which is larger than expected, and then X channel uh, uh, gives a conclusion on which one has to work. Excuse me? You I don't understand the question. If, if I oh, could you outline the argument for Kodaira Spencer? The Kodaira Spencer map is, uh, yes, uh, if one uh, uses the differential equations So we have a matrix Y, which I write in this way. It is formed uh, with the periods here, uh, periods of the, so one must choose a symplectic basis. Uh, there are a number of choices to do. And then one has the periods uh, for the lattice here, and here one has the periods obtained by the so-called forms of the second kind. One starts from this, uh, from this matrix. This matrix is such that for each derivation on the base, it satisfies an equation where this matrix here, which is called the Dwork matrix, I believe, has entries, surprisingly, which are algebraic on the base. Are the entries of this matrix are algebraic functions on the base, whereas this Y is highly transcendental. Okay? This matrix here on the, on the lower uh, left corner, is the matrix of the Kodaira Spencer map evaluated at the derivation D, uh, partial D. And uh, the condition of the criterion may be formulated simply replacing ZS by T. Uh, by T. So, so it is a, a kind of degeneracy condition for the Kodaira Spencer map. In the algebraic case, one can compute this explicitly uh, with sim very simple functions, actually, appear. Uh, the dwarf matrix in the Legendre case has very simple entries. Any other questions? Okay, okay, let's thank Mr. Kurzweil. Thank you very much again.